Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Robin Minter Smyers, a partner at Thompson Hine and president of the City Club's Board of Directors. I'm honored to introduce today's speaker, the 51st Attorney General of the State of Ohio, Dave Yost. <laughs> Mr. Yost began his career as a journalist for the Ohio Citizen Journal. When the newspaper went out of business, he changed course, graduated from law school, and practiced law in Delaware County before going into public service as a county prosecutor and later as state auditor. He was elected attorney general last year, defeating opponent Steve Dettelbach. In his inaugural speech, Attorney General Yost spoke about his role for the next four years as pushing the system towards the ideal where every person stands on level ground. In his first few months in office, he's compiled an ambitious agenda towards this goal, advocating to protect coverage of pre-existing conditions under the Affordable Care Act, significantly increasing funding to rape crisis centers and agencies statewide, and calling on lawmakers to eliminate the statute of limitation on rape. Much of his work, however, has been in response to the devastating effects of the opioid epidemic and what it's the impact it's had on Ohio. Attorney General Yost is spearheading a statewide effort announced earlier this month to study potential genetic markers that make some individuals more susceptible to addiction. He's also working to consolidate the more than 100 opioid-related lawsuits currently pending in Ohio, an effort that is proving to be challenging. Just yesterday, four drug companies reached a multi-billion dollar settlement with Cuyahoga and Summit counties, avoiding what would have been the country's first federal opioid trial, but raising questions on how the money will be allocated and distributed. Today, we'll hear more about the priorities of Attorney General Yost and his administration. Esteemed guests, members, and friends of the City Club, please join me in welcoming to the stage the 51st Attorney General of Ohio, Dave Yost. Thank you. It's uh, wonderful to be with you. I uh, have a prepared text here today, but I don't think I'm going to give it. Uh, I'd like to speak to you from the heart about the opioid epidemic itself. Um, and I've spent so much time on this for the last several years, studying and, and as Attorney General, working on the actual litigation and the policy questions. I really don't need a text and really don't hardly need uh, notes, but I, I want to begin by saying how wonderful it is to be back here in this citadel of free speech uh, and to see such an eclectic uh, group of people here. It's so many uh, friend, uh, folks that I've known for a while. Um, my friend Dick Pogue is here, as uh, is his custom. Uh, I have to say, uh, Dick, when I came to Cleveland for the first time professionally, and, and under, how many people here from the east side? OK. Uh, because I, 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 when I was a young man, I used to come up to Cleveland uh, with, to see my, the woman who would uh, eventually agree to marry me against her better judgment. <laughs> Uh, but she was a Fairview Park girl, and so I didn't even know there was an east side of Cleveland until I was 40. Uh, I, I thought this was the edge of, of the city right here. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, when, I, when I first began coming up here um, professionally about 12 years ago, uh, it was Mr. Pogue who filled me in on a great deal of the history and the colorful personalities 
um, uh, of Cleveland over the, uh, over the last decades. Uh, and I, it's great to see you doing, you're doing well, and I appreciate your friendship. But of course, um, I have my colleagues uh, and friends from the ACLU have a table here. Uh, I just uh, appeared with uh, Freda down at the law school to talk about uh, the Rucho case, and that was uh, fun, although you, you might not be surprised to hear that we have slightly differing views on the law. Um, but yeah, I, I have such respect uh, for the history of the ACLU and for some of the positions that they advocate. Uh, and for those of you, I recognize that this is still mostly a left of center city. Those of you who have not met a Republican in the wild, um, <laughs> They, they still do have a, a few naturally occurring uh, folks, and, and they are, have joined us today with the table as well. Uh, so uh, it's a great, and, and we have a, a nice diversity here uh, today. So I want you to imagine one of those really big water pipes, a water pipe that you, you would never see uh, except maybe on a construction project because they're old and you know they're at the center of the city. You know, the kind that you can walk through. They put lots and lots of water through them. And imagine that it breaks. Breaks bad. A piece of it just comes apart. And so thousands of gallons a second are gushing out up into the streets, flooding the streets. And imagine what happens. There's, there's garbage and debris that's you know, floating and washing by. Traffic is backed up for miles. Can't get anywhere. People are being washed away you know, on the sidewalks. There's just water everywhere. It's, it's a deluge. That's like the opiate epidemic. And part of the problem that we have is that we have not tried to clear, turn off, really, that water main. What we got is lots of people with sump pumps that are out there trying to clear the street. We have lots of folks with buckets and, and mops, and you know, they're trying to clean up the mess. But everything that they do is foiled because there's more water coming in every second. The only way we're ever going to be able to clean this up, get rid of the flood water, is to figure out how to turn off that water main. And I'm concerned that we haven't really thought enough about that. We have, uh, we hear a lot about, uh, from every political candidate, it seems like, you know, the three-legged stool, the Drosiopia crisis. Uh, and you all, you can tell me what those three legs are, right? It's enforcement and treatment and education and prevention. Well, I think that that third leg is actually two legs. I think it's a four-legged stool. I believe that the education and prevention are two different things. And I'd like to talk to you about that uh, this afternoon for a few minutes. Uh, because I think that that dichotomy between education and prevention is where we're ultimately uh, going to find the best solutions to the tragedies that we've seen in every community across Ohio. But before we do that, let me um, talk briefly about uh, what was alluded to in the introduction, uh, which was the uh, opiate lawsuit settlement part one that occurred yesterday. Um, probably everybody's heard a little bit of it, and I'd like to set the stage for that by describing to you what it is and isn't, and then looking ahead a little bit. Then we'll return to the great Euclid water break, uh, Euclid Avenue water break, and, and, and talk about what do we do to shut off that water main. So, First, the first thing you have to understand is there's two very large sets of lawsuits. The first set of lawsuits is right here in Cleveland. It's all over the country, and it's been consolidated into one group of cases in front of Judge Dan Polster, a learned and capable man. Uh, and 
he has a, a, a reputation of being a settlement judge. He, he gets parties to not try cases, but to settle them. And in an ordinary course of things, I think most lawyers would prefer to see a settlement uh, to a jury uh, in these kinds of cases. Uh, so he's probably a good, good selection to oversee what they call the multi-district litigation. Now within that, uh, we, we have about 165 local governments, counties and cities that have sued the manufacturers, the drug distributors, the industry as a whole uh, for the harms done within the, the opiate industry. Quick caveat, this is not a product liability suit. We're, we're not out there saying, you know, your lawnmower blew up in my face and, you know, it was defective and you owe me money. The idea behind this is, is, is essentially nuisance, that the drug manufacturers uh, conspired, essentially, to deceive people about how addictive and how dangerous this class of drugs was. Uh, and secondly, that the distributors who had great transparency into how much was going where, should have noticed that hundreds of thousands or millions of pills were going into small communities that had no medical justification uh, for, these, for, for, for these shipments and should have, should have said something, should have done something, had a moral and legal obligation to act. That, that's kind of, the, in a nutshell, what the lawsuits are about. So. The judge set two bellwether trials. Some of you may have heard that I tried to stop that. I want to tell you why. Uh, and looking backwards, it's much easier because I'm not saying this could happen. It did happen. Here's what happened. Almost $300 million has been paid to those two counties by the various defendants because they were the first ones to court. Now, there's 88 counties in Ohio. None of them have a trial date. None of them have had their day in court. None of them have been able to plead their case. None of them have received a dime. The first money is always the biggest money in settlements. Maybe sets the benchmark. There may be uh, bankruptcies later. So as a practical matter, what we have is two counties in Ohio who have gotten their day in court, who have a measure of justice, but they left the rest of Ohio behind. My job is to represent all of Ohio. Now, lest you think that I not like Cuyahoga County, where my wife comes from, and Summit County, uh, several weeks ago, um, the lawyers for the local governments came to me and said, hey, we know that you don't think we ought to be in here, but we're going to have this trial. Can we use your expert witness? Well, uh, those lawyers that are out there will know that the answer to that is generally, heck no, you can't do that. I'm not going to, I'm not going to subject my expert witness to two rounds of cross-examination as my expert witness. And the state has its own case in state court that we want to preserve that, that testimony for. But you know what? I said yes. Do you know why I said yes? Because the people who live in Cuyahoga County are also my constituents. They're also Ohioans. The people in Summit County are also Ohioans. And I didn't want them, to, even though I didn't think that they should be allowed to go first to the exclusion of all the other people in Ohio, I did not want to see them in a position where they didn't have the ammunition, they didn't have the testimony that they felt they needed to be able to tell their case in court. Well, moving on, uh, we, have, we now have this settlement. And now the question is, what about everybody else? We've got uh, just, uh, well, well over 2,000 uh, local lawsuits as well as the state lawsuits that are out there. Can we settle this globally, kind of like the tobacco litigation? The answer is maybe. Uh, I'm certainly willing to sit down and listen, but there was, a, there was some folks talking in, in the news, four attorneys general were talking in the news the other day about an $18 million or $22 million 
a billion dollar, excuse me, global settlement. Uh, I think there's a couple problems with that. The first is uh, the settlement yesterday kind of set a benchmark, didn't it, on how we should negotiate. And if you break down the numbers, that $18 billion means that uh, Kai Hagen Summit did really, really, really well. And I, so I don't think that settlement's really adequate uh, for the rest of the state that I speak for, and I suspect, uh, based on the conversations I have with other people, uh, other colleagues around the country, that they, they may have some pause too. But more important than that is the lack of detail and some very critical details. The first one is actually the justification uh, to begin with of why the state, uh, why the uh, counties and the cities, for the first time, really are competing with the state attorneys general in this litigation. Tobacco. That money went down the drain. It was used to plug a budget hole uh, at state government. Um, the money that was supposed to go to tobacco cessation largely didn't go there. It was appropriated for other reasons. And so that money's gone. Ohio sold its revenue stream, got one-time bonds, and there's, there's nothing left of that. Local governments are saying, we don't want that to happen again. You know what? I agree with the local governments on that. Uh, we don't want that to happen. The first thing that's not existing right now that I, I don't have any protection on is how do we keep the local city councils, the local county commissioners, the politicians at the state level from taking that money and using it for something other than addressing the opiate epidemic. How many people in here know somebody who's lost a loved one or, or a coworker to addiction? Look at the hands. Folks, this isn't going away. There was a big deal a few week, uh, last year or so, uh, earlier this year, I guess, where they said, oh, look, opiate deaths are down. Overdose deaths are down. We're finally turning the corner. No, they're not. We have not turned the corner. You know why the deaths the, tick down a little bit? Because Narcan's available. If you've got a friend or a family member who's addicted, you've got Narcan in your purse. You've got Narcan in your car against that terrible day that maybe you find them overdosed and you can act to bring them back. And so that's happening. You know what? They don't die and the, the Narcan use is never reported to the government. But that's an, artific that's an artifact in the data that does not reflect what's actually going on the ground. We still have that water main break, folks. It's still flooding in tens of thousands of new addicts every year, and most of them are coming from a medical pathway. So let me turn back then to what I mean by the difference between education and prevention. This is so critical, and I'm trying to get a, a, a conversation started. I hope you'll help me. The education idea is that if we give, and this is the, this is the way most of the people in this room live most of the areas of their life. The idea is that if we educate people, give them information about how addiction works, what the dangers are of, uh, of, the, of the drugs, that they'll make a decision not to use the drugs in a way that is going to uh, expose them to addiction. And in fact, we've been doing this for 50 years. Uh, it's unquestionably been effective. I, I think there are people who got that information and said, whoa, that sounds really dangerous, I'm not gonna do that. I think I'll have a bourbon instead. Uh, and, and so I'm not saying anything against education, we need to do education, but the prevention is something different. And there's a field of study called behavioral economics. The field of economics assumes that we're all rational and we're all gonna act in our own self-interest. This goes back to Adam Smith and comes forward uh, over you know, 350 years. And it's a good idea. But it, it begs the question, what happens, wh what's going on when people don't act in their own rational self-interest? What happens when they do things that don't make sense 
And is there a pattern to those? That's the field of behavioral economics. It suggests that people act in irrational ways, and when they do, those ways are predictable. There's a book by a guy named Daniel Airely uh, called Predictably Irrational. If you want to have a very readable treatment of this that has very little math, uh, check out that book. It's, it's a good read. It's entertaining. It's interesting. And it'll change the way you think about human behavior. So we are doing a, uh, a uh, we have a, a committee uh, called SCOPE. Uh, the Scientific Committee on uh, Opiate Prevention and Education. This is an interdisciplinary group of uh, scientists. We've got uh, a, a doctor of nurse practitioners. So we've got doctor of pharmacology. We've got a statistician. We've got a behavioral economist. We've got a psychologist. All these people. And they're working with each other and surveying the lit scientific literature within their own disciplines and talking about it with each other to look for clues on how we can turn off that water main break. How can we actually prevent new addicts from happening? I'll give you a quick example that some of you will probably recognize. So from, if you go through a cafeteria, this is behavioral economics. If you go through a cafeteria, you'll notice that uh, they don't have the desserts in the cafeteria line anymore, or the buffet line. Have you noticed this? The desserts are always over on a table over there in the corner. You know why that is? Because it reduces the number of sweets that you eat. And we all agree, kind of agree that we you know, don't want to be obese and have those health risks. And so the idea is the company puts that over on the side. We're not telling you you can't have it, but we're just going to make sure that you really want it. And you're not taking it by reflex. Conversely, if you put vegetables at the eye level coming through the line, you'll sell 20% more vegetables. It's not rational, but it works. It's predictable, you see. Now, I want to see this committee, and I, I got a briefing. I can't wait uh, about two more months, and I should be getting a, a report back from them on some actionable intelligence from the scientific literature. This is not theory, you know, the, the, this is not somebody thinking up some cool new idea. This is stuff that's drawn from the peer reviewed scientific literature to say, okay, we know this, we know that, we put these together and, and apply it in this situation. We can predict and expect that this would be the result. Very excited about this. I'm going to work with the governor and his Recovery Ohio program to take these ideas and bolster the idea of prevention because we've got to turn off that water main so that we can clean up the rest. What about cleaning it up? What about cleaning it up? Did you know that of the people that complete a 30-day residential treatment program, which is kind of the gold standard right now, it's a lot of thinking that it needs to be long, longer than that, but that's, that's what we kind of do right now is 30-day residential treatment. They graduate from that successfully. They've withdrawn from their physical addiction. Three out of four of them, 75%, are going to relapse within 180 days. It takes, on average, I'm told by practitioners, seven interventions for somebody to achieve a year of sobriety. We can't arrest our way out of this problem, but folks, we can't treat our way out of it either. Treatment is a sump pump. It's a mop and a bucket. We've got to turn off the, the pipe. So moving on, I want to, the last thing I want to mention is why do some people get addicted and others don't? I was talking to uh, Dr. Fryermuth from uh, University of Cincinnati Emergency Room. Incredibly bright woman, uh, works all the time in ER, sees these people coming in, and of course, all kinds of other people who are in pain. And she said, I wrestle every time I, I have a patient, do I give them the opiate to control what is often excruciating pain? Or do I make them bear it because I'm concerned that I'm going to make an addict out of somebody inadvertently. I had back surgery 
in 2014. They gave me oxycodone. Uh, it hurt bad for the first couple of days, and I was glad to have the oxy. And then I stopped taking it. I didn't want it anymore. I got rid of the balance of the prescription. Uh, wasn't addicted. Didn't particularly like it. I didn't get addicted. And yet I know a man, a friend who's a Marine who was injured, was given a doctor's prescription. This is not a druggie. This is a United States Marine. Takes his prescription, gets hooked. Eventually loses everything. His house, his job, his family. Ends up doing hard time in prison for theft that he committed trying to support his habit. What's the difference? Is it willpower? The guy's a United States Marine. He's got more willpower in his little finger uh, than, than I have in my whole body. Is it character? Is it toughness? No. It's almost certainly genetic. And so we are working uh, with some scientists, uh, Dr. John Sprague, who runs our, uh, the Attorney General's Center for the Future of Forensic Science, uh, is leading this along with Dr. Fryermuth. We're going to get 1,500 cheek swabs, voluntary cheek swabs, from people who uh, have a Narcan incident, if you will. They presented an ER with an overdose. And we're going to compare that to a control group of people who are like me, who have, you know, post-surgery had opiates but didn't have any ad ad addiction issues. And then we're going to run about 180 gene markers that we know have some associate with some function uh, related to addiction, the dopamine pathways, the development of dopamine receptors, and et cetera, et cetera. In a year and a half, we should have a mathematically verified tool that can tell every doc through a very simple on-site test whether the genetic markers for addiction are there, which means that people like Dr. Fryermuth don't have to guess anymore. They don't have to wrestle with their conscience. They'll have a scientifically validated tool that's going to be able to say, we're not going to give this person the opioids or we're going to give it to them, but we're going to monitor it very closely for signs of incipient addiction and act quickly. We're not going to give them a bottle of 10 or 30 days supply. We're, we're going to watch it closely right in the, in the hospital. I didn't come here to talk about the difficulties, although I have talked about a lot of difficulties. There's a lot of barriers. This is complicated stuff. And it's going to take us 20 years as a society, as a society to get past the, the place that we are and begin to bend that trend downward. But I have great hope. I really believe that we have a great opportunity in front of us. And that's why it's so important that any settlement has guardrails around it so that that money doesn't go to pay for ancillary government expenses, but goes to fix the opiate problem. We're never going to get this kind of money again. We're never going to have this, this kind of capital to thoughtfully and deliberately attack this problem. My commitment is I'm going to see this thing to the end of the litigation, but I'm going to make sure that the end of that litigation is putting the money back on the streets in our local communities doing the smart things that we need to do to be able to turn this thing around. My name is Dave Yost. I'm your Attorney General. It's been my great pleasure to be able to come and talk to you about something that's very near and dear to my heart. Today at the City Club, we're listening to a forum with Ohio Attorney General Dave Yost. We're about to begin the audience Q&A. We welcome questions from everyone, City Club members, guests, students, or those of you joining us via live stream. If you'd like to tweet a question, please tweet it at the City Club, 
and our staff will try to work it into the program. Holding the microphones today are Office and Customer Service Coordinator Tiffany France and Director of Programming Stephanie Jansky. May we have the first question, please? Good afternoon, General. Uh, I'm not going to ask you about the opioid settlement. <laughs> My name is Vince Lombardo, and I was an Assistant Ohio Attorney General for 27 years, having served eight attorneys general, and I'm also a proud member of the City Club. And one year ago today, I was privileged to ask you at the City Club candidates debate, OAG candidates debate, a question. And my question was, can you name one section of the office that does not involve law enforcement or consumer protection for which you plan to provide more attention and support? And you answered you plan to give more attention to the antitrust section. So my question today is, what support have you provided to the antitrust section since your inauguration on January 14, 2019? Great question, and thank you for the follow-up. Uh, I remember your question. Um, and, did you quit because I got elected? <laughs> okay. um, it, actually, one of the first things I did, because I've never practiced, I'm a former county prosecutor, I'm a former small town lawyer. Uh, I, you know, this is, antitrust is not something that was in my bailiwick. So the first thing I did was ask the career staff and, and the section chief there, uh, Jenny Pratt, is a nationally renowned expert. She's a leader in the field. And I said, Jenny, I, I need to read the law. I need to get smart about this because this is some, something that I really want to be involved with and I don't understand law in it uh, other than the you know, high level uh, you know, Sherman Antitrust Act kind of stuff. Uh, can you give me something to read? I got a four-inch notebook uh, full of uh, everything from the original Standard Oil uh, case that was actually decided by the Ohio Supreme Court. One of the early antitrust uh, cases, landmark case, came out of Ohio. Uh, and I'd never read it. I have now. Uh, all the way through the uh, Microsoft decision and the, the American Express decision uh, here a few years ago on uh, uh, two-sided markets. We have added one person uh, to the section. Uh, I have joined groups uh, that are looking at a number of things that I'm not allowed to talk about, but include B -tech, big tech. Um, and I was... Uh, talking with the staff earlier, I hope that perhaps next year I might be uh, invited back uh, because I think we got, I think we got antitrust wrong uh, originally. I th I'll give you a quick tease. Maybe, maybe you can pressure them to let me come back. Um, I think this is all about the aggregation of power by a few. And it's the third time we've had a major systemic shift. So originally it was uh, political power and the political um, monopoly of, on force, the use of force. And we resolved that as, as tax uh, law and standing armies and police forces enabled political leaders to gain greater level of controls and wage wide, wide uh, wars and uh, oppress societies, we figured out ways to restrain that aggregation of power and to separate powers. There's a familiar term. The second wave was the Industrial Revolution, which was economic power. And we looked at what was going on and decided it was an economic problem. And I think some of our responses to it have been perhaps economically slowing, but we failed to fundamentally recognize that the issue was the aggregation of power in the hands of a few, which has the corollary of making all of us as individuals somewhat less free. If we understand antitrust in that kind of a continuum, and we today we see this third wave of information, which is once again giving an opportunity, a platform for a relatively small group of people to aggregate enough power to control our society, I think it suggests maybe some different public sector responses that have more in common with the first, and it makes me wonder whether the 
antitrust response to the second wave was really the best and most efficacious way we might have responded. So I, I'll leave that there, but I've, the answer is I've put some money, I've put my, my mental thought and my time into that section. So I, that's promise kept, sir, promise kept. General Yost, thank you so much for coming. My name is Daron Kalir, and I teach at Cleveland Marshall College of Law. Uh, two weeks ago, the United States Supreme Court heard oral argument in a Title VII case that asked the question whether LGBTQ members should be protected in the workforce under the term because of sex. You have signed an amicus brief objecting such protection, explaining eloquently that it is not for the court to do this kind of legislation, but it's the legislator who should do that. Considering that stand on separation of powers, would you be considering to support the Ohio Legislator Ohio Fairness Act? So uh, that's a great question. Let me start by saying that my office has an anti-discrimination uh, policy reg regarding sexual orientation. Um, so this is not an issue of whether I support uh, uh, discrimination. I don't. And in the area where I have unilateral action, um, you know, my policy speaks for itself. Now, would I support the, uh, the act? There's two problems uh, that I have with doing that. The first is there uh, may conceivably be legal challenges to that. There are important um, First Amendment and uh, rights of conscience issues that are unaddressed in the current version of that bill. Um, I tend to be cautious about speaking uh, on a matter before the legislature because I have the statutory duty to defend it against legal challenges. Uh, and frankly, I was disqualified as prosecutor uh, from a case because um, uh, my client leaked my confidential letter that said basically, don't do this thing you're thinking about doing, because if you do, you're going to lose, and there's no defense for it. Uh, and of course, it was attached to Exhibit A to the lawsuit in the Supreme Court when that happened. Um, so I, I'm cautious about that. The second thing is, I, I'm not sure that the proper, uh, that, that our best set of remedies is litigation-based. and. Um, I, I think that there's, we need to think about how do we respond to uh, discrimination. And, but for those of you who didn't hear what he falsely called my eloquent uh, uh, explanation, I, I think it's <coughs> worth mentioning because this, this is critically, critically, critically important to each person in this room. You might be thinking, well, I, I, I'm not, I'm not gay, what, what does it matter to me? Here's the thing, we obey the law because we're on notice as to what the law is and what it means. A judge who can help you by changing the meaning of a word can hurt you by changing the meaning of the word. We have to all agree on what the words mean that come out of Congress, come out of the General Assembly. We all have to understand a common meaning or there is no notice, there is no rule of law, there is only the whim of the judge that you happen to draw for your case. The judge should apply the law the way we understand that it is written and what the words mean. If times change, if our values change, if we advance and we need to update that, we must. But the failure to go through the legislative process means that nobody has notice as to what's prohibited. And that's why, that's the principle that I thought was important enough for me to speak up on, on Title VII. Thank you for the question. Yes, with the hundreds of millions of dollars coming into the state and to our local government, has the AG office thought about putting out a website for transparency of how much money these uh, 
different local uh, governments are receiving, how that money is used, and what organizations, nonprofit or profit, in trying to help curb the uh, opiate uh, situation. No, but I'm going to now. Great suggestion. <laughs> Yeah, give, give the man a round of applause. He's making better government. Um, hello, my name is Jonathan Shore. I'm a law graduate working with the Legal Aid Society of Cleveland. Um, I agree with you 100% on, you know, need to, need to cut off that water main. But I, you do raise some concerns when you start, start to talk about um, doctors having, you know, greater ranges of uh, stopping or, or having more restrictive methods of keeping individuals off of opioids. Um, it's a significant medical treatment for a lot of individuals and my concern comes in, we start thinking about minorities, specifically African Americans who ha already have a hard time and difficulty um, gaining access to these types of um, prescriptions be it because of racial bias or what have you in the medical industry. I didn't know, have, has your office looked into that and how um, these restrictions wouldn't possibly restrict you know, um, even further the access to these medical treatments for um, a lot of um, individuals, minorities, who have been um, almost removed from these type of treatments as um, currently. Thank you. That's a great question. And let, let me uh, say that I don't want to see these uh, drugs to be unavailable, uh, and I don't want to see them restricted to the point where we create needless suffering. Uh, and because of that, I generally don't like rules that just cut every way. Let me tell you about a better way that's happening without government regulation right here in Cleveland. The Cleveland Clinic has a, anybody here from the Cleveland Clinic? All right, you know, hats off. I, I, I appreciate your leadership because they have an internal committee that looks at opioid prescription among all their physicians. They plot this thing out uh, they sort it by specialty so that you don't have, you know, an internist, you know, and an orthopod uh, being compared to each other because it's very different practices and very different needs for pain relief. Um, and they plot it out. And they look at the people that are two standard deviations out, uh, you know, out basically on the 5% five, five on, on the ends. And they do peer intervention. They, they do peer-to-peer, doc-to-doc discussions within the profession. And so what's happening is that that, um, that curve is narrowing as people become more careful about making their decisions. I think that kind of educated professional response is a lot better than having some politician in Columbus say, why do you need more than six pills? So that's, where I, that's what I'm for. And, and I'm, I'm not one of the folks that's trying to set per se limits and, and rules to tie the hands of the physicians that we trust to, to, to take our care. I'm Mark DeTore, and I was just wondering, is it feasible, I'm no home rule expert, is it feasible to go to the legislature and I'm a United States District Court receiver, and w if I had that kind of money distributed to me, I would distribute it on a pro rata basis to all of the counties. Is it feasible to go to the legislature and say, look, any of this money that comes in for this opioid gets distributed pro rata to the counties, depending upon how many people are in population, so that everybody does get served? Yeah, so we were actually <laughs> looking at a, uh, some statutory language to in effect to do that. It didn't say pro rata, but um, it would have reserved a uh, portion of money for the locals and then distributed through the state the rest of it. And uh, that was not popular uh, among local government officials. Um, I it took a couple of weeks, actually, and two staffers to take all the arrows out of my back from that little adventure. Uh, <laughs> You know, the, 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 we are probably so far into this that it's impractical to have a legislative solution regarding the opiate crisis. Uh, but we ought to think about the future uh, of the justice system because allowing 
every single local jurisdiction to speak for a portion of a state claim, which is what's happening here, um, is bogging down the justice system and makes it very, very difficult to negotiate a settlement or to try the case. Uh, and, and I think there's several different ways we could go. We need a solution. Um, but, you know, if you're volunteering, You were previously a journalist. How does that? I did history... it in private, and I washed my hands <laughs> afterwards. How does that history as a journalist affect your perspective and your priorities as Ohio Attorney General? So the reason I became a journalist um, was because I saw. I grew up during the, the Watergate thing, right? And I saw the hearings, and uh, I saw the power of finding the truth and shining the light. And I thought that was pretty cool. But at, at, the, at the bottom of the thing, at the foundation of the thing, it's really not about journalism, per se. It's about the truth. And so law enforcement is kind of doing the same thing. Politics, when it's done right, is about the same thing. Education is about the same thing. It's about finding what's true and either correcting the bad things that are true or celebrating and preserving the good things that are true. But that time uh, as a journalist, was foundational to me in developing my ideas about what is true, uh, what's righteous. And along the way, it also taught me to speak uh, clearly and quotably, which sometimes gets me into trouble. Quote, being quotable is not always a good thing. Hi, thank you for being here. I, I welcome this conversation. Um, my name is Michelle Rieli Sorrell, and I'm a nurse at the Cleveland Clinic. I oversee the forensic nursing program. And so our nurses come in and we take care of patients that have been uh, victims of physical or sexual assault. And we're seeing more and more of patients presenting for medical care that are victims of human trafficking. And we're seeing a correlation with the opioid crisis and the control by the trafficker on this person. They start them on drugs to control them and to exploit them. So my question for you and my challenge is, is what are we doing to hold traffickers accountable for starting these young people on op opioids, knowing they might take seven times to have to go through treatment to get clean. So why are we not having s more severe penalties or um, holding them more accountable or doing something because they've not only kidnapped and exploited a person, but they're um, creating an addiction that might, they may never overcome. So I'd like to see more severe penalties for that. Thank you, uh, and it is already, there's a crime called corrupting another with drugs. Uh, the challenge is by the time we're involved in a human trafficking case or your local prosecutor, police are, uh, that is so far in the rearview mirror um, that it, you know, it's, it's difficult to get there, either because of statute of limitations, proof problems, uh, evidence. Uh, we still have to prove every case beyond a reasonable doubt. But I'm with you. This modern day slavery doesn't use chains. The chains are molecules, they're, they're addiction. Uh, but they're every bit and maybe more effective than iron. We'll, we'll be putting out a legislative agenda shortly um, that will do a number of things to hold traffickers more accountable. But l let me talk about something for just a second. There's a lot of, of people who might be considered baby boomers in this room. And I, I don't want to get moralistic and say what people should and shouldn't do in private. But we're going to propose that the crime of solicitation, which right now applies to both the buying and selling of human sex, be split into two crimes. And that the buying of the of sex is the more serious crime. Right now, it is the less serious crime. 
Now, some people, some baby boomers, some people that grew up in, through the 60s and 70s may say, who are you to decide whether people should be allowed to you know, buy sex? Here's the problem. When a man, and it's almost always a man, is talking to a woman about performing a sex act for money, when she says yes, you don't know what's behind that yes. You can't tell by looking at the person you're talking to whether she has made a rational, informed decision that says, this is the easiest way for me to get some money to pay my rent. I'm just going to do it. Or whether there's a guy with a club or a knife or her next fix in the next room or down in the parking lot in a car. You got no clue. And what that means is the man who's buying sex is assuming the risk, the probability, in my experience, that that woman is actually a slave, isn't going to get the money, and he doesn't care. Sorry. Call me judgmental. That's a criminal act, in my opinion, and ought to be punished that way. Attorney General Yost, uh, a lot of the premise of your remarks today, Ohio's at the epicenter. We hear a lot of the opioid crisis. There's uh, no other state save maybe West Virginia has more opioid deaths per capita. What I want to ask you is, there, are there things here in Ohio, and maybe you've referenced some already, that uh, lead us to believe Ohio can be the best place to find the solution to this crisis? Are there unique things that we have here that you've seen in your job that we bring to bear on this better than any other place can? That's a great question, and uh, I think that our institutions of higher learning uh, are incredible medical uh, facilities and systems. Uh, we've got world-class scientists and doctors uh, here in Ohio. Uh, I think we've done way too much of the same old, same old. Uh, Governor DeWine promised last month a, a top-to-bottom review of our behavioral health system in Ohio, how we fund it, um, what the best practices are. Look, right now, the money flows from the state down to local boards, which then distributed among providers. Uh, I'm fine with that. Uh, I, I think a local board is probably better informed than somebody downtown, uh, Columbus, in a, in a, sitting in a cubicle somewhere. But I also know that there's incredible variation between the county boards. And some of those county boards are just funding the people that they've always funded. They have no idea how effective they are. And in fact, when I was auditor of state and I was really focused on performance metrics, we last about two years of my term there, we, we spent a significant period of time looking at the data and the lack of data. Here's the truth of the matter. Nobody can tell you today in Ohio whether our treatment uh, facilities are effective from facility to facility, county to county, city to city. There just isn't good data. Now, some of them have good data about their operations. Some have little data. Uh, some have unreliable data. But the system is not set up to be able to say, let's do this. This program here, this works better than anything else. Let's put all of our money over here. I think that's where we need to get to. Uh, and the way to do those evaluations is to draw upon our great institutions of learning, our great institutions of medicine, and let that wisdom inform our public expenditures. Thank you. Article that said that more than $31 million is owed from charter schools that have closed. And I also read in that same article that when the county prosecutor does not recoup that money, then it falls on the sh shoulders of the uh, attorney general. And that money certainly would be able to help school districts like Euclid, Cleveland Heights, Parma that have been devastated by the recent Ed Choice uh, expansion. So, do you have a plan to try to recoup that money? And if so, um, how, what would you do? So we are, we have a bunch of lawsuits where we're trying to collect the money. 
Uh, here's the practical challenge. The way Ohio's uh, system is set up is we throw all the money up front, and then when a bad school goes belly up and closes, there's nothing left. Uh, you might have a little bit of equipment that you can sell off. Maybe there's a building, but probably not. Uh, Dottori over here you know, has, to, has to do You've got a couple of these cases, don't you? But, but the bottom line is we really need to change the way we think about funding these schools and we need to change the way we uh, monitor things so that these that they don't get out of hand uh, and end up you know going out because this we're going to get pennies on the dollar for most of these because the people leave uh, and there's nothing there to collect against and I'm not happy about it, by the way. I've testified in the legislature and asked for greater accountability. We've gotten two separate bills that were passed when I was auditor to heighten the scrutiny, which is, has been helpful, but it's not enough by itself. Ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to hang around and talk with anybody that would, would still like to, but I want to be mindful of your valuable time, of which you've given me an inordinate amount. It is 1.30. Thank you for your attention and the uh, honor to be with you. Today at the City Club, we've been listening to a forum with Ohio Attorney General Dave Yost. Community partners for today's forum include the League of Women Voters of Greater Cleveland and the Ray C. Bliss Institute of Applied Politics at the University of Akron. We appre appreciate your partnership. We welcome guests at tables hosted by the Center for Community Solutions, the Cleveland Clinic, the Cleveland Rape Crisis Center, the Legal Aid Society of Cleveland, Ohio Guidestone, and the Republican Party of Cuyahoga County. And that brings us to the end of today's forum. Thank you, Attorney General Yost, and thank you members and friends of the City Club, with a special thanks to City Club members whose financial support make our work possible. To find out more about upcoming forums and how you can support the City Club, visit us online at cityclub.org. This forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.